All right, let's get started. Um, if I don't make eye contact during this presentation, it's because I'm staring into this light, so nothing personal. I'm going to take a picture, so either yell no if you don't want me to or duck your head down if you don't want to be on a picture. Exciting DrupalCon presentation for me, hopefully for you. Um, okay, this is Drupal 8 module development, Mad with Power. Um, so my name is Ted Bowman. I work at the office of the CTO at Acquia. Um, I'm Ted Bow on Twitter and Drupal.org. Probably best way to get in touch with me, uh, Drupal-related stuff or otherwise. Um, I'm a core developer, uh, so Acquia pays me to work on the API First initiative for Drupal 8 and UX initiatives. Um, I'm the maintainer of the settings tray module. Uh, mostly work with core REST and core serialization. I'm also doing a, um, uh, working on a new distribution called Reservoir, which is decoupled distribution, um, which if anybody is interested, uh, can ask me out about afterwards. Um, so who are you guys? Who are module developers? Okay. Who is new to Drupal 8? So some, oh, a lot of people. Um, who's new to Drupal altogether? Some people. Uh, who's come from Symphony? Maybe has Symphony experience outside of Drupal. A few people. Um, who's new to object-oriented programming? Okay, cool. Just trying to get a kind of idea. Um, so this is uh, not really like an intro to Drupal 8 module programming. This is kind of um, so Drupal 8 is pretty different from Drupal 7. Um, I come from a Java background, so I really like a lot of this stuff because this is, there's a lot of stuff in Drupal 7 or actually, I came to Drupal in Drupal 5 and there was a lot of stuff that was like, what's going on? I, I hate this. Why do I have to name this function exactly the same way? And uh, so now in Drupal 8, I got used to it and then Drupal 8 came around and I was like, oh yeah, this is getting rid of all the stuff I hated about Drupal that I forgot I hated. Um, so for me, it's really nice. It's a big change, but I think, you know, mostly for the better. Um, so today's examples are going to be, I think, powerful, um, sort of new things that you couldn't, you either couldn't do in Drupal 8, uh, sorry, Drupal 7, or were kind of hard to do or hard to figure out. Um, I think they're cool. I think they're hard to figure out. Like, it, a lot of these things took me a while to figure out. Um, so I'm not going to go through, like, how to make routes and stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of tutorials for that. There's hopefully some basic Drupal 8 sessions here this week. Um, so there is a Git repo. Um, you could probably just Google GitHub Tedbo and find it, but um, it's github.com Tedbo Drupal 8 Power. And so all of the modules uh, that I'm presenting are in this one repo just so it's easier for presentation. So um, if you want to look at them, you could look at them now, or, but if you want to see them, don't worry if I go through the code. Well, am I just the wrong height or something? <laughs> just really bad. Um, so if you don't, if I go through the code examples too fast, um, I mean, definitely ask me questions, but also realize you'll be able to see all these code later. Um, so today we're going to go over, you know, the importance of object oriented programming, importance of having an IDE, and I think I, some people I've talked to after this talk when I've done it other times, if, if I get no other message across to you that Drupal 8 is much, much easier if you're using an IDE, so an integrated development environment. Um, I use PHP Storm, but there's other, uh, other really good ones also. I'm sure I used to use Eclipse. It was good. Um, I'm going to talk about base classes, base fields, extending classes, creating uh, condition plugins, and then just to emphasize again, importance of an IDE. Um, an IDE and object-oriented programming. So Drupal 8 is uh, object-oriented. It is more complicated, but it's more encapsulated. I feel like it's more self-documenting. You can look at the code and kind of figure out what's going on more than, than I could in Drupal 7. I think especially if you're not coming from Drupal 7, if you're coming from other uh, frameworks, it, you might find it a lot easier. Um, because it's self-documenting, um, I find it a lot easier to learn. And again, all of these things, uh, the, the whole self-documenting and being easier to learn kind of depends on you using an IDE. Um, so we're going to have examples of each module, sort of talk about if they're object-oriented, how an, how an IDE helps us, and then going to stop and demo. Um, 
Okay, so first concept I want to talk about is base fields. And base fields are not the fields that you see on the manage fields page. These are fields that Drupal has made for you, either core or another module. So these aren't fields typically that you can add or remove just from the UI. Um, so examples of on the node uh, entity type, we have author, the create a date, the change date, and the content type itself of a particular node. These are all base fields. On the user, we have the name, mail, uh, password, and roles are all base fields. So these are things in Drupal 7 that weren't, um, they were called properties in Drupal 7, but in Drupal 8, it's all using the same field system, which we're going to see, we get a lot of advantage of that. Um, so base fields use field widgets and field formatters, much like, um, much like the fields that you add do. Some of them are configurable, some of them aren't configurable. Um, you can actually add new base fields through codes and you can alter existing base fields. Um, so base fields examples is the node author field, is an entity reference to the user, so we see it down here. Um, it is form configurable, meaning you can change instead of, say, autocomplete, you could actually change it to a drop down. Uh, though, if you have more than five users on your site, I probably wouldn't recommend that. Um, so it can use the entity reference widget. So any widget that you can use on, um, say, the tags field, you could potentially use on the author field. Um, it is not display configurable. Uh, so uh, you're not going to see it here, display the author or not. I think, I'm sure there's probably a module to do that. Um, it, yeah, so it's not view configurable. Um, so you won't see it on the manage display tab. So another base field is user roles. So um, in Drupal 7, I guess this was a property, but this is actually an entity reference to a role, which is a configuration entity. So in Drupal 8, you have the concept of content entities, which is usually stuff that you're going to somehow enter through the UI. Uh, well, configuration entities you would enter through the UI also, but configuration entities you would export through configuration. Usually, the, well, you can, the di main difference is, or one way to tell is if you have a lot of them, they're usually content entities. So the user roles is a configuration, um, an entity to, any reference to a role configuration entity. Um, so you can use a lot of the same formatters, but not all. Um, you can use widgets. Uh, it's not configurable by the form by default, so you can't say, oh, well, I want to change the, uh, I think it's a checkbox by default, I want to change this to an autocomplete. It's not going to give you that ability. Um, and it's not view configurable, so you can't say, I want to display the roles and I want to display them as links to roles or whatever. Um, so let's look at an example module. This module is called Real Author. Um, so it tracks who really wrote the content. So often, you'll have a site where people are signing in and they're filling out content, but they're filling it on behalf of another user or maybe somebody who's actually only represented by content on your site. So if you maybe run a you know, blog for a famous author, maybe they don't even sign in. Um, so it separates the Drupal user from the author. Um, so an example would be we have the node entity type, we have the author, which is a user entity, a user entity reference field, and this is what core provides. Oh, darn. All right. Um, let me know if that happens again, because I probably won't see it. Um, and then our module, the real author, would actually create another field that's also a user entity reference field, and this would, we'd call it real author, but same thing. It's basically sort of on the same level. Um, so real author removes, this module is actually going to remove editing configuration from the author field. So if we're going to track who's the real author by having somebody enter in another user, we want to use the core field to just say whoever signed in is automatically just the, just the core author. Um, so the author is always going to be the signed in user. So we're going to do this by implementing one hook in the base field info alter, and we're going to add a new field. And we're going to use another hook, entity base field info alter, and we're going to remove access to the author field. So that is going to give us on the manage forms page a, another field uh, that is real author, and we can change to whatever autocomplete 
or um, drop down, whatever we want. Um, and we're not going to see this on the managed fields page again. So even though we're adding this through our module, it's like core's author field. It's, we can't take it away via the UI. Um, one of the real big benefits of this is it actually shows up on uh, the table. I think it's called node data table. But basically, where we, where all of the other um, what would have been properties in Drupal 7 are on the table, so they're not connected by a field table where you have to do a join. It actually is on the uh, sort of the base node data table itself. So we have our real author right next to the node ID, right next to the type or the UID, which is the the core author. Um, and of course, this would uh, have a lot of performance implications because you're not doing a SQL join. Um, so is it object oriented? So not exactly in the fact that we're using uh, an old school like Drupal 7 hook, um, but it does benefit from Drupal 8 classes. And let's take a look at how that works. So before I, this is a little clip to avoid me doing all live demos. But uh, so if we see this up at the top, it's uh, we're implementing hook uh, entity base field info. So basically, this is where we can add new fields if we want to. We're basically uh, checking to see if it's a node entity type. And if it is, we're creating a new base field that's an entity reference. And we are going to um, field other author. I guess I left put this twice. <laughs> um, we're going to, yeah, create the real author field. And then once we start typing, because this is, because I'm using an IDE and it knows what real author is, it actually can tell me all the methods that are available and easily lets me uh, fill them in. So I did label, description, cardinality, meaning only one of these fields. You could have two, obviously, if you want two authors. I type is required, which is wrong because that's telling me if it's required. I want to set that it's required. Again, in IDE, you'll see that pops up and tells me, hey, it's expecting a Boolean here. Um, and then I want to set the display configurable. On the view, I want to say, yes, it's displayable on the basically managed display tab. Um, if I wanted to know what it is, I can just sort of look in here. And because um, I'm using an IDE, I can go to the help and it can say, oh, it's expecting either view or form and then a Boolean, a Boolean field. Um, so in Drupal 7, instead of actually methods on an object, how would you do something like this usually? An array, a big array probably. Um, so in Drupal 8, we had these, we had, we did have hooks, so it's similar in that we have hooks but I don't have to send back a big array of like configuration for the field. I actually forgot what the hook was in Drupal 7 for this, but you can pretty much be a safe bet that somehow in Drupal 7 it would have evolved a big nested array. Um, so I like this way better because um, one, I don't have to memorize what the keys for the array and the values are. Um, the fact that when I start typing, my ID can say, hey, you, have, you can set the label here. Um, and then if I didn't know, say, for set display configurable, what that actually means, it's going to easily pop up help and tell me what it, what it might mean. Um, whereas in Drupal 7, I was always going to the API pages on Drupal, um, on Drupal.org to say, you know, what am I supposed to put in this big array? So there's still some big arrays, so don't worry, um, especially in the render system. Um, the other code in, let me just look at this, uh, in my IDE, try and make this much bigger. Real, oh, wrong place. Real author. Um, so this is basically what we set here. The other one that we are doing here is the hook entity base info alter. And here, again, I'm looking to see if it's the node entity type. Um, and I grab the UID field. And here, I want to display configurable. And I want to say, by default, you can configure on the form the... Uh, you can actually change the author from, say, uh, autocomplete to a dropdown. I want to actually take it away from the form, the managed forms place page uh, 
altogether, and then I also want to set the display options none, meaning it's never going to show up on the form. So I'm basically taking away the regular author field. So how that sort of looks, what I showed in that video is, because my uh, IDE knows this is a, uh, a field, then as soon as I type the arrow here, it's going to tell me all of the things. So I don't know. Does anybody prefer bigger arrays over this? <laughs> OK. Um, and the other thing, nice thing about this is if I hit, in my, my case, F1, I can uh, you know, see if I didn't know what display configurable was, I could do that. Also, it's really easy to jump to the actual where this is defined if I wanted to see um, what's going on. I really recommend also in Drupal 7, but in Drupal 8 especially, um, when you're sort of calling these functions, if you have time, just click on them, open them up, see what they're doing. I think learning from uh, learning from core and other modules is a really great way so um, to learn sort of how Drupal works, but also really good code examples. Check my time, 12.15, doing great. Okay. All right. Okay, so other ideas for base fields, you could use a term reference for your main site categories. So instead of adding a field, a term reference field, you could actually have it in code. So when you turned on a module, nodes just got a term reference field directly on their node table. Um, that would provide better performance and also you wouldn't have to configure it each site. Another idea for a way to use base fields and modules is you could potentially put a entity reference to a user on the term, on the term entity type. So you could actually implement a sort of authorship type for terms. Um, so for date time based fields, um, Drupal has created and changed timestamps, but not a first published date. So you could actually add a base field that's first published. Of course, you'd actually have to, you know, write implementations to say, okay, once I've created this field, I won't, when it's first published, I'll, I'll save the date. The other one is a user block date. So if you block users, maybe you want to have an idea how long they've been blocked for. So, but there's not a field on the user for that. So you could actually add it via the base field to be on the base table and say, okay, this user's been blocked for one year. Maybe I should just kick him off or maybe that's long enough to block him. Um, you could do an original import ID on any entity type. Say you're migrating them in, you could actually add a base field that says, hey, for this legacy system that we brought it in, I want to always remember no matter what um, the ID. And maybe you don't want that to be display configurable or form configurable. You just for safety, you just want to have it for whatever reason. Um, so remove access to the published date. So you can maybe take that away so people actually can't configure on the form. Um, you could take away the form widget altogether for, and just published date would always be the default value, which is when it's actually published um, or created, I guess, in this case. Um, you could make the roles widget configurable if you have tons of roles on your site. Instead of the checkboxes, you could do an autocomplete. Because again, roles is just an entity reference. So any of the widgets you can use on any reference, you could use that. Um, so the next module I want to talk about is the show user fields module. So this basically makes hidden base fields viewable and configurable. So if we look at the user type, we have fields roles, last login, last access, and these roles, you, uh, these fields, you don't actually see them on the form where you can configure them. Um, and we're going to implement the hook entity base field info alter, and we're going to change the fields to be display configurable, so you can actually display them in the manage display and, and say, okay, this person has XYZ role, so everybody can see it, or this person last accessed the site on, you know, June 23rd. Um, is it object-oriented? So in the same way as the previous module, it's not object-oriented in the sense that we're using hooks, um, but it does benefit from Drupal 8 classes. So let's take a look at that. So again, in this module, we're still only going to have a, um, a dot .module file because we're just implementing hooks. And we're going to, that's not the help, that's the help hook. Uh, so we are going to implement hook entity base field info alter. And again, we're going to check to see the entity type is user. 
Then we're going to have a list of, ro of fields, and we're going to say, for these fields, we want to loop around and do something with them. So we're going to make sure that it's actually there, um, make sure some other field, other module didn't remove it. And then we're going to uh, set the then we're going to set the display configurable to true. So this by default is false. So basically, when you go to the manage display page for users, you don't see the ability to say, show me when this user was la last accessed the site so everybody could see it. Um, one thing I do want to show about tonight, I, this is PHP Storm, but I'm pretty sure other IDEs use this. Right now, if I take this field, I again can um, have all the information about all the methods, but by default, if I actually messed up this line before, now the ID has no idea like what field is. So it's basically saying, I don't know what this is. You can you know, invoke methods, but I'm not going to help you here. So what's happening here is in the previous example, the module actually was the field was a return value of a function of a method that the IDE knew about. So it knew like, oh, you're returning it from this method. I can look at this method. I know it returns a field definition. So I'm going to give you all the information about it. But in this case, um, I'm just grabbing it from an array. So it doesn't actually know what's stored in that array. So it's going to say, well, you know, it's, an, it's something, but I have no idea what it is. You can give your uh, IDE hints. So I'm saying, hey, the variable field is of this particular class here. So as soon as I do that, and I start typing, it's going to say, hey, I know what, um, actually, let's see what it is. It's a base field definition. Um, so it's going to say, I know exactly the methods that are on a base field definition. Um, so sometimes you actually have to go through a, which I'm not going to get, go through in this talk, but you maybe have to use a debugger sometimes. You could var dump it to see what it actually is. I, I do step debugging. Um, so you might not know right out of the bat that that's a, a base field definition, but you could say git class, print it out of the screen, and then update your code like that. Um, the other thing that's really nice about me doing that is uh, it's going to tell me, hey, df is not a function here. It's not a method on this object. And pre presumably, if, um, the, if you've heard of the policy from uh, upgrade policy from Drupal 8 to Drupal 9, we're going to remove deprecated functions. If something like set display or set description here was deprecated in Drupal 9, the IDE would tell me like, hey, you're using deprecated functions. So I could use the inspection to look at all of my custom code base and say, tell me all the deprecated functions I'm using. Uh, you know, Drupal 9's coming someday, so um, it'll help you. <laughs> but we're adding features to Drupal 8, so it's not that important. Okay, um, all right. So we set display configurable. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. Um, so again, it's not, um, it's not object-oriented in the way that you've heard about plugins uh, for Drupal 8 and their classes, but it, it still benefits from the fact that we're using object-oriented in Drupal 8 and benefits from a really good IDE. Um, this is the code I just showed you. Um, and then here, Last, on the, on, I can actually display last access, last login. I can display also the roles here. And they show up on the manage display like any other field. So I, I mean sort of the, the main sort of get the takeaway from the last two modules is base fields are in a lot of ways just like other fields. It's just you have to implement them through code, either adding your own or taking stuff, taking away or changing existing ones. Um, so the next module is the no access entity reference label. It's a very succinctly named module, I think. Um, so this allows reference entity labels to you to view, view the labels without actually having entity view access. So basically where I got this idea is if you look at an, a node and you see the author, but you don't actually have permissions to view profiles, you still see the name of the author but there's no link to click, right? But that's not true if for other entity reference. So again, the author on a node is just an entity reference. So if I have another entity reference that is to content, by default, it's not going to show me what the labels are. Again, the label for a node is the same as the label for a user, it's the same concept. 
because I don't, I don't have access to see it. So I want a field formatter for entity references that show me the title, but only show me the link if I ac actually have access to it. Um, so it makes these, the viewable entities will actually be links. So again, it acts like the author label for other references. And this one actually implements no hooks. So um, this is an example here. We have linked content, which is an entity reference field. We have this art to, art to a uh, node, which is a link. And then we have another node that's called you cannot view me. And we still can see the label, but it is not a link. Um, so is it object-oriented program? Yes, it's object-oriented. We have a class. Um, we're going to create a new plugin, and it's called the no-access entity reference label formatter. And it extends the entity reference label formatter. And we're just going to override two methods. So let's take a look. Okay. No access. So I don't know if I can, I can't zoom in here, but um, so we have the, the uh, folder name, no access reference label. Um, there's no dot module file in here, so Drupal 8 modules don't need dot module files if you're not implementing hooks. We have a source directory, and then under that source directory or SRC directory, we have plugin, field, and field formatter. So all of your plugins generally are under the plugin folder, and then the particular type, we have the directory here. So if we look at this class, maybe not, don't need it so big. Okay. Um, right here we have an annotation. So basically when you have a plugin in Drupal 8, we use these annotations in the comments. Ooh, that's not indented correctly. Um, we have these annotations in the comments that actually mean something. And this is, um, if you're familiar with Drupal 7, this often replaces an info hook. So I think there was like hook field info or something like that in Drupal, or this would be hook formatter info, something like that in Drupal 7, where you basically, again, would return a big array. Um, this maybe not so much better in that, yeah, we're just creating an array except an annotation. Um, but it's better, it's better performance the way it scans this. So I'm saying, hey, this annotation is for a field formatter. I'm telling you my ID, telling you a label, description, and I'm saying, hey, it can be used on entity reference fields. And again, I am uh, extending the entity reference label formatter. So if I really wanted to know what that did, I could go here and I'd say, okay, I can see every, all the code on here. So basically making this module, I looked at what the original formatter did, and I said, okay, I only want to change like one or two things, so I'm only going to change, override one or two methods. Um, so the methods that we're going to override are, make sure I get this right, uh, are view elements. So basically like what happens when you're viewing those labels? And by default, again, the regular any reference is going to say, hey, if you don't have access to view the actual entity, I'm not going to show you the label at all. Uh, we don't want that to happen. Um, and the other thing that I'm going to override is the get entities to view, because basically that is what's going to determine which entities we view. Uh, so I'm not going to go exactly in um, to what it does, but those are the two ones that I have to implement uh, in order to Override. So basically, a lot of times when you're either creating a new field type or a field formatter or a widget, a good way to start is if you see something in core or contrib that, and you need something like that but a little more custom, is to take that uh, class for that formatter, that field type, or that widget and say, I'm going to extend this and I'm going to only override maybe the view or the access or something like that. Uh, okay. Um, so usually, yeah, when, you, when you're trying to implement a plugin, um, potentially you could overwrite a particular plugin, so find one that's similar. So if you have a field formatter, like in my case, the re regular entity reference formatter 
or label format or did everything I wanted except for the small thing. Um, and then I would try to extend it. Um, if I couldn't extend it, if I looked at the entity reference um, label formatter and said, you know, this, I would just end up wiping out everything in there. Um, I want it to be different. I would look up to its parent. And if its parent, uh, which is like a sort of generic entity reference formatter, I could then start from there. Um, so if I look, let's just sort of crawl down to see how that would look. So if I started off with the entity reference formatter, you know, I'd re I would look here and I'd say, oh, you know, this, this use basically displays a label for an entity reference. If that's not what I wanted, I would actually click up here to the formatter base. So now I'm at the entity reference formatter base. This is an abstract class, meaning I can never actually use this. This is not going to provide a formatter, but it's going to be the parent for all my other entity reference formatters. So if I look here and now I, I highlight this and I go to navigate type hierarchy, it's going to tell me all the other formatters that go from there. So the way core does this is we have this formatter base, which is for all fields. A little more specific is the entity reference formatter base. And then underneath there is all of the ones that core provides. Um, we have the entity reference entity formatter, meaning I want to display the whole entity, the whole node of the whole user or the label formatter. I just want to display the label. Um, and then we have one here, entity reference taxonomy term RSS formatter. You can guess what that does. I've actually never used it. Um, then we have the ones that I implemented myself here, which is the entity reference. Oh, so if we look at the entity reference label formatter, we could go down further and see, oh, okay, here's the one that I actually made myself. Um, so that's sort of a good way if you're, if you're looking at a particular plugin um, and you want to see what it does or what other ones similar like it would do, I would go up the chain, then look back down, see what's there. If I want to go even more general, just keep going up the chain, then look at its children, and then dive back down. All right. Um, so yeah, this is just sort of saying, actually, yeah, this is sort of saying how the IDE would actually help me find a plugin. So if I knew like, hey, there's any reference on the site and I know I can see them and I know there's the concept of formatters, I could just do this. In this case, it's uh, shift command, but basically I would say I want an entity and then I know it's a reference and then I know it's a formatter and now it's sort of narrowed it down to all the formatters for entity references. Um, so that's sort of one of the things I really like about Drupal 8 versus Drupal 7, is this encapsulating it into separate files makes it really easy for me to find the things. So it doesn't, um, in Drupal 7, say if, if I wanted to find all of the formatters that work for entity reference fields, I would actually have to look at all the hooks for fields and then look at what they returned. Um, did they return something that worked with entity reference? So the fact that they're all in their separate classes and I can easily search their classes by name, for me, really helps it be a lot simpler. So in some ways, the complexity of having more files, because they all have separate um, responsibilities, actually makes it easier for me to learn. ID for the win. That's sort of the whole, one of the whole things about this presentation. Um, other ideas for extending field plugins. Um, actually, that's usually the question when it's a smaller group, but we can, we can talk about that in the, in the question answer. Uh, so now the other concept I'd like to talk about is condition plugins. Um, so condition plugins are unified system um, that really just simply evaluate to true or false. Um, in core, they're used to determine block visibility. So when you go to add a block and it says, hey, show this block at a particular path or show this block for a particular content type, that is a, a condition plugin. Um, and that's how they're used in core, but in, in contrib in Drupal 8, 
uh, stuff like panels, I think context is now ported, ported to Drupal 8. I have a module called Block Visibility Groups. Rules, they all use the same condition plugins. Um, so in Drupal 7, basically we had a bunch of sort of conditional systems in core and contrib, but none of them used actually the same thing. So if you had a condition on rules that you thought, oh, this would be a really cool thing to use on panels, you couldn't do it unless you install this module that had sort of rule access control for panels, which then gave you a lot of complications. So the fact that we're using sort of the same condition system all across core and contrib has a lot of advantages. So the example module I'll look at is author conditions. Um, so the condition is a node author has certain roles and we're gonna say, so usually the, auth, the roles condition in Drupal core is actually like who's looking at this? Like I will show this block to people who are administrators. But we're gonna create a condition plugin that says show this block if the main node on the page, the author is an administrator. So maybe, or maybe probably more reasonable example is if this is a premium member, show this extra information in a block. Um, so this is gonna extend the core user role condition. And again, no hooks. Oh wait, so now we're gonna go to the IDE. What did I say it was called? Author condition, author role condition, okay. Okay, so again we have a module that has has no uh, no dot module file. It has a SRC directory, again with a plugin directory, but this time we have a condition folder, so we're saying this uh, module implements, or this plugin is of con the condition type. Um, and again, if we look here, we have the author role condition, and it's going to extend the user role condition. So I actually want to see these others. Tabs for the win. Okay, so if I want to see what the actual role condition does, I, I could look through here. And again, plugins have these annotations, so I have to say it, hey, I'm annotating something that is a condition. I have to do a few things for Drupal to pick it up. I have to put it in the right folder structure, I have to use the, the right namespace, and then I have to tell it, hey, I, this is a condition, so I'm going to give you information again in the comment. Um, and if I don't get this right, Drupal will, I think when I clear cache it will, it will show me an error. Uh, hopefully the errors got better. It used to be not so helpful um, when it was parsing, in a, parsing a, a condition and it got it wrong. Um, the other thing here I'm telling it is, I'm saying, hey, this condition has a context. Um, so this is not context like the context module. Again, this is a nice sort of unification thing in Drupal 8 is this context is the same thing that panels in Drupal 8 is gonna, gonna the same concept that it's going to use to determine uh, when to display certain panels. But I'm gonna say, hey, I need an entity that is a node and it is a required context. So basically, if I'm not displaying a node on the main page, then this condition should not be evaluated. Um, again, I have to just uh, implement this function called evaluate. And so let's actually see if I didn't know what I needed to do. If I just had the user role here, and I knew, I know that user role condition does a whole bunch of things and I wanna change certain things. So what I would do is, oh, I hope I'm, yeah. So I would say I want to override the methods. And it's gonna tell me, okay, here's all the methods that you can override. Um, I probably don't wanna go down, like way down here to object, um, but I do see the user role and I know that how I'm going to evaluate whether a block should show up should be different from the core user role because that's basically saying if the, if the user who's looking this role, I want to say the user who is the author of the node. So I'm going to say, yeah, I want to evaluate author. Um, so I've actually already done it up here, so I'll delete that one. Um, 
I would get configuration here. So basically, we're going to have a configuration form for these uh, condition plugins. The other thing that you will notice here is that I actually don't have anything in this class that does the configuration form. The reason I can get away with that is because even though my functionality is different from user roles as far as how it's evaluated, my form is exactly the same because I just want to show a bunch of roles that you can click check boxes. So one of the benefits of me extending that class is all the functionality from the base class that I am I don't want to override that I don't have to put in my class. Um, so if Core found a bug with how the uh, checkboxes were made for roles, I would automatically get that. Um, so I have my configuration, so if I say, if I don't have any roles checked, then just return true, basically meaning if you didn't check anything in this condition, then just don't worry about it. Um, otherwise, I'm going to get the context of Node. And again, because we're using classes, if I didn't know, like, how do I, you know, how do I get that node that I told it I need? I can just start typing. I know it's a context, so I'll just start typing context. And then it's going to tell me a bunch of things. So cache context, no, that's not what I want. Um, get context is probably what I want. So I could confirm that it's what I want by looking at the help. But I happen to know it's what I want. Um, the other thing here is I'm saying get context of node. So at this point, Drupal actually doesn't know that it's a node, or my IDE doesn't know that it's a node. So again, I'm using this comment here to say, hey, by the way, this is a node. So that allows me to do Oh, I'm going to get this right, wrong. Node, come on. Okay. Yeah, so this allows me now to grab a bunch of things. I think author might be one. Get revision author, get, yeah, that would actually get me it. So I could say, hey, get me the author. And because that's going to return, it knows who returns a user. So I could actually do, uh, I would actually have to get UID, say, on here. So again, it, your IDE is going to know what type of object uh, certain methods return, and then you can get more stuff from there. Um, but I'm basically going to say, hey, get me the author entity if the roles for the author entity intersect somehow with the roles that are checked, then return true. Uh, I had to change the cache context, but you can look if you look at the GitHub. You can see the explanation for that. I won't get into that right now. Um, and I think that is the last module I had to show. Condition, condition. Let's see, I talked about that. No hooks. So, questions? Uh, yeah, I think you spoke good. Yeah, go to the mic so that the recording can hear it. Yeah, I think you maybe have to go out there, yeah. In the mm, hi, yep. Hey. Uh, in the first example, where you um, create uh, an, uh, a new base fields for yep. the node, yeah. Uh, database update for the creation of the fields? yes on clear. I think it would. It ought. Uh, oh. uh, we have to write uh, as in uh, Drupal seven uh, update no. schema. No, no, because oh. it's it's saying that. The hook user fields will will actually add that field because it you're telling it, hey, this is a new base field in the entity type, and a lot of Drupal 8 is abstracting the database away from you, so you're not actually saying, and actually it's even sort of abstracting the idea of the schema away from you. You're saying this is a field, and Drupal should should handle however it handles fields. You could potentially have a different type of database, and it would create that too. Any other questions? Um, that was quite uh, a valuable session and Thanks. quite beneficial. Uh, I, I'm a beginner for Drupal 8 and I'm still learning, but uh, what happens is most of the times I see a module who's doing something uh, very similar to my requirements, but yep. it doesn't exactly do what I want, right? Yeah. So, 
uh, at that time, I, how can I uh, uh, like find what point uh, at which um, function or class I should extend or like uh, modify to get the things done my way? So yeah, so one like one way that I use when I have no idea where something is coming from, mm -hmm. um, I often look for a string in the user interface. So if we look at, let me see if I can find an example. Um, but if we look at the structure, content types, uh, user articles, managed fields. Mm. Actually, let me do it on the node add page. So if I was adding an article and I thought, let's say this was, I don't have any contrib on this site, but let's say I wanted to say, you know, where is this authoring information coming from? Like, how is it making that? I mean, usually what I would do is I would copy that, I would look in my IDE, I would search all of Drupal core, but if you just installed a module, you would work, look in that module folder. Um, I don't want it to be case sensitive, authoring information. So actually at this point, there's only four instances of that string in Drupal core. Um, so it's actually on the node form page and potentially I would look for when it wasn't a, a node. Uh, but this, you'd see similar cases if it was like a field formatter and there's a special label in that field formatter and I wanted to know where that class comes from. Oftentimes if you, I mean obviously like learning the general principles about plugins and stuff like that, but if you're completely lost, oftentimes taking something out of the UI and searching, say the module you knew it came from, and trying to find that string, look at the class there, and then sort of go up from there. Yep. Any other questions? So the evaluation, I forgot to put a slide, but if you go to the session, there's an evaluation link for the survey, um, and, and definitely let them know how I did. Any other questions? All crystal clear? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Is there a, a threshold for using base fields uh, compared um, to regular yeah, fields for so negative performance I, impact? Yeah, I wouldn't use them all the time. And I mean, most of the time if you're not worried, like you're not crazy worried about performance, uh, I wouldn't use them. I more often find that I'm altering them than adding them all together. Because um, oftentimes there's a base field that's not viewable or it's configurable on the form and you don't want it to be configurable. Um, so I would say a base field is really only if you're really worried about performance or if you want to change the fundamental functionality of a certain entity type that's often provided by contrib and it doesn't make sense to ask for that feature in contrib because what you are doing is very different from how most people would use that module, then I would consider adding a base field. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I, I did some base fields uh, earlier and uh, noticed when I changed them yeah. and uh, had already existing entities, uh, entity update didn't work anymore because it's, uh, it's, it gives a notice that there are uh, entities with values. Yeah. Are there good examples of uh, like uh, update hooks or? Yeah, I'm not, yeah, I was sort of talking about stuff at the beginning. Um, I'm trying to think, I know there's a field or two that's been added to core, I can't think what they are right now. Right. But I would look at the core change log. Maybe the node module. Or yeah, I think the node module may have yeah. something. I know there's something in D8 that was added afterwards and they had to do an update. Okay, I thank you very much. Yep. Yep. Do you have any recommendations for creating the whole skeleton? You need to find the, the right namespace, you have to write the correct annotations, etc. So yeah. you can have lots of typos like yeah. do I use templates or, what's, or what do you use for, for debugging? If things like um, yeah, I use Xdebug, but like for Skeleton, if you like don't know how to make a plugin per se, um, Drupal Console is really good for that. Um, so Drupal Console you can go through and say, I forget the exact commands, but you know, basically I want to make a new plugin. Uh, what type of plugin do you want? What's the label? And then it would make the annotation for you. The other thing is sort of copying files and then just renaming the namespace. Um, so sort of looking at a plugin that, that maybe doesn't do what you want but is in the same type 
just sort of copy it over and change the namespace and stuff like that. Is that what was the question about? Um, more the question, what happens, or what do I do if it doesn't work? Oh, what so, if it doesn't work? <laughs> maybe I have a type of something. Um, like, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think whatever effort it takes you to get step debugging to work, whatever, how many ever tutorials it takes you to get to run through, it will be worth it. Like if you're planning on being in Drupal for any length of time or any object-oriented programming, it's like you have to learn. For me, I, I personally had to learn step debugging. I learned it in Drupal 8, 7, but it was much more user-friendly in Drupal 8. And just sort of setting breakpoints to actually get here. Um, uh, that's, that's what I've done. I mean, you can, you can var dump stuff out there. Um, I think the plugin managers, there's a concept of plugin managers in Drupal 8, and those are actually really interesting to look at. So if you can actually, if you have a field type, and if you have, say, a plugin that's a field type and yours is never showing up, you can actually put a breakpoint in the plugin manager for fields and say, hey, you know, stop here and then I'm just going to step through and see why my plugin is not loading. You actually learn a lot about Drupal 8 that way. I mean, it'll take a while, but you learn a lot about Drupal 8 and you'll figure out sort of why it's not loading. Often, it's not loading because of annotation purposes. Um, and that, again, I think is, um, you know, an IDE that's aware of the concept of PHP annotations is really helpful because it'll give you, um, even though it's not code per se, it does give you warnings to say, hey, you didn't close this properly or whatever. So that's really, really easy mistake to make it is because it's not code, you don't get as, um, you're not necessarily going to get a hard failure in your annotations. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to get a white screen of death. If it's not there, it just won't be picked up. Okay, thank yep. you. Yep. Any other questions? Oh, no. All right, great, thanks. So don't forget about the survey. It's really helpful to me. It's also really helpful for uh, DrupalCon in general as far as selecting sessions and, um, you know, good or bad, surveys are good. Good is good, but, you know, bad is helpful also.